Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We wake up in a very different world than we have experienced over the last few decades of Vladimir Putin invading Ukraine. We don't know exactly how, how great the, the carnage is, how massive the damage is in the fog of war, but it is likely to get uh, much worse. And so we are extremely fortunate to be joined at very short notice by our good friend, Tom Nichols. Tom, thank you so much for coming on the podcast uh, today, because I know that you are very, very much in demand. Of course, Charlie. It's good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Okay, before we get into everything, so did you get much sleep last night? No, I did not. Um, I could, you know, military operations like this one usually begin in the middle of the night for them. And so, um, you know, when it started up, it was already late our time. And I stayed up to watch what looked like a pre recorded speech from Putin that was just pure crazy pants. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, I, I stayed up for that and, uh, cause it aired at something like 6 AM Moscow time and, uh, it was, it was creepy. So yeah, um, I've been trying to stay with it. Well, I, I saw that you tweeted out also that you haven't had this, uh, kind of pit in your stomach since, uh, the cold war era. And mm -hmm. I, I have to admit, I was a little shocked how hard this hit me last night. It was one of those things where. We had, you know, said never again, never again. And then to just think about this basically small nation alone facing this full fury of the Russian army and, and the whole world is, you know, waving hands and everything. And, and yeah. there's Ukraine alone. Yeah, it, it hit me the same way, too. And, you know, this is part of the curse of being, you know, over 40, I guess, that you actually can have these Cold War memories. Yeah. Um, but the idea that a country that still hasn't recovered from the Soviet experience still has a, for a country of its size, has a ridiculously small GDP and low standard of living. And yet their dictator has decided to prioritize, you know, nostalgic dreams of glory. I mean, it, it is, it's nuts. Uh, and, you know, to see the Russian army on the move, um, that's why one of the things I tweeted last night is, you know, to anybody that I said tw over 20 years ago, I mean, I was talking with Polish colleagues and saying, come on, you know, I mean, this is, this is a different Russia, you know, they're not going to try and roll over Ukraine and threaten NATO. Right. And, uh, and I was wrong. I mean, I just, I couldn't, you know, maybe I was right in 1999 to say, mm, you know, the Russians aren't really interested in this, but, um, you know, some Putin, I think has really become that guy in a way that he might not have been 20 years ago. I know there's a lot of argument and really it doesn't matter now. There's a lot of argument about, was he always like this? Did he become this? Um, uh, but it, there's something to watch him now, there is something very strange about him, something very detached and, and kind of flattened. And, he, you know, his speech was full of these heavy sighs, you know, where he'd be talking and he'd kind of, uh, you know, with this. And I just thought there's just a weirdness to it that then when, when it's combined with watching those forces moving across the border, yeah, yeah that's when you get that feeling Terrifying. in the pit of your stomach. So is he a completely rational actor at this point? I mean, I guess, you know, part of this debate is, you know, he's been very, very savvy. And obviously he has the measure of the West and he's planned this for some time. That doesn't necessarily mean that he's not a little bit unhinged and crazy or in some sort of an information bubble that is causing him to behave in a somewhat irrational manner. What, what is your take on that? I think all of those are right. I think the words I've been using are unhinged and in a bubble. And um, it's it's interesting you bring up rational actors because, you know, when we, in during my teaching career, you know, we always try to educate people about policymaking and what does it mean to be a rational actor. And I think on his own terms, he is a rational person. He has preferences. He acts on them in a very, you know, organized way. He knows what he's doing. You know, to, to be irrational means that an irrational person likes chocolate one day and vanilla the next day. Yeah. Right. Whereas, you know, rational people set up preferences and say, I like A, I like B, I like C. And so in that sense, he's rational. But there is another part to rationality, which is, are you connected to reality? Can you process information? Uh, do you understand what people are telling you? And are you perceiving the world and the facts around you 
in some way that isn't so mangled by your own internal cognitive prism uh, that you're really not, you know, hearing people. And the, to give an example of that, Saddam Hussein, when people told him, look, the, the allies are about to invade, they're going to cross the line of departure. And Saddam kept saying, no, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's irrational. That's just, I can't accept, you know, or Hitler, when people were saying, look, we're losing at Stalingrad and Hitler would say, no, no, we're doing fine. Tell them not to retreat. That's irrational. I'm a little concerned about, I'm a lot of concern, you know, not a little concerned. I'm a lot concerned that Putin is seeing the world and, and taking in that information in ways that only make sense to him. So he could be internally rational and think that he understands what he's doing, but completely disconnected from what's happening in the world around him. I, I want to spend more time on, on this subject. And I just want to let people know that we're going to be continuing this conversation later tonight. Actually, um, Tom, you're going to be joining us for the Thursday Night Bulwark live stream, uh, really a special live stream. Uh, Bill Crystal is going to join us, Amanda Carpenter, uh, and you. And uh, for Bulwark Plus members, I think this is going to be a great opportunity to go into real depth and detail. Um, and of course, if you're a Bulwark Plus uh, member, you can leave questions for us to discuss. So on this issue of rationality, it, it certainly has been interpreted Putin's comments this morning have been interpreted as threatening the use of nukes if the West uh, in, intervenes. I'd like your reaction to that. Is he serious about this? Um, and this is why I'm asking whether he's a rational actor, because we, we, we are at the, it, it feels like we're at the precipice of something that we have not really thought about for decades. What do you think? The nuke threat? I think um, it, it's possible. He has, over the years, I, I have heard rumors from Moscow that he has asked questions about nuclear release that have made people uncomfortable. But I think for now, we are not in a nuclear crisis. I think he is serious that if he thinks NATO is intervening somehow, that he will threaten the use of nuclear weapons. I'm primarily worried about a couple of things. I'm primarily worried about an accident where mm -hmm. either something happens and he mistaken, this comes back to the rationality problem, where he mistakenly attributes something that happens to Russian forces as having been done by us, which he will consider NATO intervention, or that he lashes out thinking he's striking Ukrainians and he takes out NATO aircraft somewhere or something gets off the handle. I mean, there's a, once you put this many military forces in motion, there's a hundred thousand ways that things can go wrong. The other, I think, is if he gets it into his head, and this is where I suppose we really do need to think about his state of mind, if he gets it into his head that this reconstruction of the Soviet project has to include the Baltics yes, or NATO territory of any kind, then we are going to be in an epic. I, I almost hesitate to say it because I don't want people to worry because we're not there yet. But no. you asked the question, like, what yeah. could do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, right. That would be an epic uh, level of crisis because that would be a direct threat against members of NATO. And NATO was formed to provide a collective defense against Russia. Yeah, that's right. Article 5 stuff. I, I have to say that one of the things that moved me last night was watching the the statements of the governments of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. I mean, they're right there on the border and they did not mince yeah. words and they are standing strong and they are right there. So these brave little countries, who, quite frankly, if they were not members of NATO, they'd be toast now, wouldn't they? The Baltics would be for sure. So what do you think? And again, keeping in mind the amount of disinformation, wrong information, fog of war, etc., what do you think is going on right now? What is Vladimir Putin's goal in Ukraine? Is he trying to seize Kiev? Is he trying to, is it shock and awe? Uh, what, 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 do you think, what do you think the war plan is at the moment? As you pointed out, we're all going to talk about this again tonight at eight right. o'clock. We'll be much smarter then. Right. And we'll know because the reports as we, as I am sitting here and as we speak, yeah. the reports are that they're heading into Kiev. Now, what, what they're going to do when they get there, uh, I, I, I don't know, um, you know, that uh, they might choose to, I mean, are they going to try and take over the, the actual government? Are they going to try and capture Zelensky or something? Um, you know, um, 
I don't, I, I just don't know. Um, I mean, clearly, one of the strategies would be, and you, you correct me on this because you know so much more than I do about this, but you decapitate the government, put in some sort of a puppet government, but don't try to occupy the country. Do you think that that would be the game plan? I think so, because occupying, I mean, Ukraine is gigantic. It's big, yeah. Um, it is, you know, the it's basically from from Boston to Chicago down to Richmond. You're talking about trying to occupy the equivalent here in the United States. We trying to occupy like the entire Northeast all the way out to the Midwest and down to D.C. So I, I think they don't want to do that. And I think Putin does not want to have a lot of body bags coming home to Russian mothers. I think he also, believe it or not, may be serious that he regards the Ukrainians as Slavic brothers and sisters and probably doesn't want to kill a lot of them. But the goal here, I think, is definitely to collapse the government and replace it with a government that's going to look sort of like his mini me in in Belarus um, and create this kind of reconstitute the Slavic core of the old Soviet Union and Russian Empire. Now, again, how he does that, hard to say. I think um, Professor Lawrence Friedman and I, Laurie Friedman in London, you know, we're we're two of the few people that keep saying he's not a good strategist. Hmm. I think people have really gotten into their head. He's a he's a wily Russian chess player. He's a you know deep thinker. He's a look. The guy was a lieutenant colonel in the KGB and not really good at it. I mean, he was stuck in a backwater assignment for most of his career. This is not an exceptional human being by any standard. Huh. And I think, you know, this notion that he's got this all gamed out, I mean, I think he's operating almost entirely on emotion. That's interesting. That's what Gary Kasparov told me on the podcast last week. He said, you know, he's not a chess player. That's not the way he thinks about it. So there's always the danger of underestimating someone. And as you're pointing out, there's also a danger of maybe overestimating that there's may not be deep thoughts here. Yeah. To understand Putin, and I'm said this this morning on Morning Joe, we were all asking the question, what does he want? And both Julia Yaffe and I kept saying the same thing. He wants it to be 1975 again. He <laughs> wants the Soviet Union to be one of the, the two superpowers. He's not really interested in socialism or communism or any of that nonsense. He's all about wanting to have a gigantic, mighty state back under his control. So more Peter the Great than Stalin? Uh, I think every night he looks at a portrait of Yuri Andropov and says, you gave up 10 years too early. Ooh, okay. So let's talk about the Ukrainians for a moment. Just a reminder that President Zelensky is a former television comedian. I'm not denigrating him, but I'm just getting a sense of, you know, whether he is, you know, how he has matched up to the moment. Um, you know, for the last several weeks, he's been saying, no, 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 don't, don't, don't overhype this. It's not imminent. It's not imminent. It's not imminent. It turns out that everything we said about Putin's plans turned out to be true, which is actually kind of reassuring that all of the intelligence right. released by the U.S. government and Joe Biden has, in fact, been vindicated, which, again, is not always not always a given. Uh, Zelensky gave um, a very eloquent speech yesterday where he talked about, you know, war is pain, blood, mud and death. And but then he said, you know, if Russia attacks us, we will defend ourselves, not attack, defend. And in attacking, you are going to see our faces, not our backs, our faces. So give me your sense of Zelensky and how he has handled this and handling it now. Well, first, let me say that I agree with you about how reassuring it is that the Biden administration has been right every step of the yeah. way so far. You know, that there is not, I mean, there's just no sense as I felt in 2014, where I think we got caught flat footed by a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, there just, there just wasn't that sense this time around. I mean, and I thought, um, one thing that, that isn't talked about enough is the way that Biden was willing to take risks with U S intelligence and reveal things as a way of firing across Putin's bow to say, listen, we know what you're doing. Here's the intel. Here's my proof that I know. And now you know that I know. I think the, um, you know, the people that are trying to turn this, and of course, you know, we both know who they are, the people that are trying to turn this into some narrative about how badly the Americans have handled this, I think is, um, mm -hmm. 
it, it's just silly uh, at this point. I mean, I've never hesitated to criticize this administration, but on this one, I just don't have a lot of room to say anything critical because I think they've, they've done it well. With Zelensky, he's handled it as well as a guy who's never had any experience in politics could handle it. <laughs> I think he made some stumbles early on when he lashed out at some of the other NATO countries. He drew some hot shots back from people like the former president of Estonia saying, you know, Sonny, you know, we were putting our country, we were putting our own houses in order for 15 years while you guys were screwing around in Ukraine and not getting ready for a day like this. And I think it's never a good idea to appeal to your allies by saying, you know, if you don't help us, you're next. So, yeah. I mean, it was human and understandable, but also it's a lesson. And and I, just like you said, Charlie, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing this to slam Zelensky, but it's a lesson to voters everywhere that international politics is serious business. It, I'm sure it seems really great and a hoot to say, let's elect this comedian who's promising to clean up the government. The rest of the world, you know, does not allow for on the job training. Uh, I want to play a little bit of uh, audio because I think that there was one sort of iconic moment um, that, I, that I think people are going to be playing for a long time. This is the, and I know you've, you've, you've seen this, this is the Ukrainian ambassador to the United Nations talking to his Russian counterpart last night. And this is what he said. And I welcome the decision of some members of this council to meet as soon as possible to consider the necessary decision that would condemn the aggression that you launch on my people. There is no purgatory for war criminals. They go straight to hell, Ambassador. You know, Tom, it, it strikes me as that that's one of those sound bites that's going to be played for a very, very long time. That there, 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 yeah. are, there are certain moments, and the United Nations, I think, you know, is not always very effective, but every once in a while, it is a scene of high drama. And I think of Adlai Stevenson, I think of other moments, you know, in the, in the United Nations. That was, that was one of them. Yes. I, I, you know, it's, as you were saying that, Charlie, I was about to interject and say, Adlai Stevenson, I'm yeah. prepared to sit here, you know, don't wait for the translation. Uh, you know, I want an answer and I will sit here until Hall freezes over. The other moment like that. We are, we are um, so old that we remember that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, the one I, well, I, okay, I was two, but the one I saw in real time that I remember uh, later in my life was uh, Gene Kirkpatrick yep. playing the 1983 Korean shootdown uh, oh, thing, yeah. you know, with the tape of the pilot, you know, the target is destroyed and all, all of that. And yes, the United, that's what one of the things that the United Nations can do is to provide that kind of global stage for a moment like that when the Ukrainian ambassador, who may not have a home to go back to, mm -hmm. says, there's no purgatory for war criminals. You're going straight to hell. So let's talk about what happens now, what the appropriate response is. The Ukrainian foreign minister put out a tweet last night saying, you know, please, you know, the world must act immediately. Uh, the to-do list, number one, devastating sanctions on Russia now, including SWIFT, which is cutting off Russia from the world financial system. Fully isolate Russia by all means in all formats, weapons, equipment for Ukraine, financial assistance, humanitarian assistance. What do you anticipate? You can answer this either way, what you think they're going to do or, or what they should do. If, if, if Joe Biden was on the phone with you saying, what do I need to do this morning right now to respond? Um, you know, earlier today, and I've used this quote before from one of my favorite movies, The Untouchables. You know, everybody remembers the line about the Chicago way and you put one of his in the morgue and so on. But that's not the line that I think really matters here. The line is, if you're going to open the ball on these people, you have to go all the way. And that would be my advice. It's like no more pussyfooting around. I mean, I'm already seeing news reports that the European Union is is kind of backing away from cutting Russia out of SWIFT. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, so what do I think should happen? I think you should open the ball on these people and go all the way. It's very hard to get to Putin financially or politically. I mean, he just doesn't care. He's got money squirreled away all over the place. The, the guy probably sleeps like Scrooge McDuck on a you know pile of gold for all we know. But the people around him can be made to feel this, and they should. Their kids should be sent home from Europe. Their visas should be canceled. They want to be Russian patriots? Good. Let them live in Russia um, but, and but, use but, Russian money. 
but to really degrade his ability to wage war and aggression, no, don't not. you don't you need to hit the full economy? I mean, this is no. Russia has been described as a gas station with with nukes. But if you shut off the gas station, yeah, if you shut it down, it's hard to do sanction. You know, people. I think Americans have always had an overestimation of what sanctions can do. Sanctions helped to bring an end to apartheid, and that only took about 15 years. You know, the problem with sanctions is that a dictatorial government like Putin's can pass the pain off to a population that's willing to bear it. And degrading his military, he has the military he needs. I mean, the yeah. one thing that he has spent money on is his military spending. Americans, again, they get misled. They say, oh, American military spending is much more than Russians. Yes, because we actually pay our officers and enlisted folks real money and provide them health care and housing and all that other stuff. But, I mean, by Russian standards, Putin spends a lot of money on the military. So the idea that we can Saddam Hussein this and put him in yeah. a box and degrade, it's not going to happen. All right. So let's talk about what happened last night and put this in some political context, because while this war is unfolding, we saw the entertainment wing of the GOP, I thought, really be clown themselves. I mean, not just you know, Tucker Carlson, who continues to uh, double and triple down on his uh, pro-Russian propaganda. But then you had a truly bizarre moment. And, and I say that having had so many other bizarre moments where the former president of the United States calls into the Laura Ingram show. Now, Laura Ingram is, you know, saying that, uh, you know, that the Zelensky speech was was pathetic and all of this. But and apparently Trump had earlier given a speech down in Mar-a-Lago to his club members where he praised Putin as being smart because he's taken over a country for two dollars worth of sanctions. So then he, he calls into Laura Ingram's show and Tom, this actually happened. Now we basically have the Ukrainian uh, ambassador to the United Nation, Nations looking like a defeated man. Uh, your final reaction? Well, I think the whole thing, again, would have never happened. It shouldn't happen. And it's a very sad thing. But you know what's also very dangerous is you told me about the amphibious attack by Americans. You shouldn't be saying that because you and everybody else shouldn't know about it. They should do that secretly not be doing that through the great Laura Ingram. They should be doing that secretly. Nobody should know that, Laura. And, you know, no, you they're, they're, That was the Russian. Those are the, no, those are the Russian, the Russian uh, amphibious landing. No, I thought you said we, that, I thought you said that no, we were sending no, people in. Oh, no, okay. I did not. No, 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 no. Oh, that, would okay, be, okay. that would be news. That, that would be that's news. All, and you no. know what? Hey, Laura, that's all we need. That'll be next, okay? Now, we ought to protect our own borders. You know, we ought to get to the southern border and start protecting the southern border. So I wrote in my newsletter this morning, you know, to paraphrase Winston Churchill, for fuck's sake, the former president of the United States is thinking that American troops are invading Ukraine. I mean, you want to talk about a guy who is not a rational actor. Yeah. And, and the last 48, I know nothing ever changes, but the last 48 hours, where Trump has decided he's doubling down on his admiration for Vladimir Putin. It's been an extraordinary moment, hasn't it? Yeah. You know, with Trump, you're talking about someone who's both irrational and stupid. I mean, it's just a reminder that for four years, we had to endure a presidency led by one of the most genuinely amoral and stupid human beings ever to disgrace our public square. And I say amoral rather than immoral, because if he were immoral, it implies he knows the difference between right and wrong. Yeah. Um, he, he's a goldfish. I mean, he just swims where the food pellets are. But, you know, this always comes back to it. I mean, Trump is awful. But what must it be like to be Laura Ingram and to sit there and do this and know exactly what you're doing? I mean, is Tucker Carlson so full of grievance that, you know, and, and Laura Ingram so full of inchoate rage that they will actually support yes. the dictator of the Kremlin making war in the center of Europe simply to, because it owns the libs? I mean, is that is that the depth to which these people have sunk? I guess the answer to that is yes. Isn't yeah, it? that's that's a rhetorical question. I mean, look, we know where, where MAGA world is. We know what the entertainment wing of the Republican Party is. It, you know, Fox News, Tucker Carlson. Uh, I, you know, if you saw this, uh, Steve Bannon on his show had Eric Prince on. 
and they yeah, said that we, should be, we should be supporting Russia because Putin is anti woke and has no tolerance for LGBTQ. Yeah, forget the assassinations, the war crimes, all of that stuff. It's you know all about all about that. CPAC is meeting down in Florida this week. Tulsi Gabbard, who is yeah. a Putin apologist, has a prime speaking role at at, at all of this. So I mean. It, it does seem that right now there's some real cognitive dissonance between the entertainment wing of the Republican Party and the elected wing of the Republican Party. The you know entertainment wing is all in on Trump and isolationism, and they will you know continue to you know, come up with these rationalizations as long as it's anti Biden. But give me your take on the reaction of elected Republicans, even, <laughs> and I'm going to regret saying this, even Marco Rubio and Ron Johnson are issuing statements condemning Vladimir Putin this morning. So it seems that at least for now, speaking of goldfish, they're not buying in on the pro-Putin spin. So what do, what do you think about this? Does it, does it change anything? And just to add another name to the uh, God I'll regret saying this yeah, yeah. list that, that you just went to, and even Mitch McConnell. Yeah, you that's, know, le- that's uh, less surprising to me. Well, the entertainment wing of the GOP tends to control the political wing of the GOP. So to have, so to have these electeds kind of stepping forward and saying, no, no, we actually do have a, have a serious job to do here in Washington and no supporting the Russian army rolling through Europe is not one of those jobs. But, you know, we've spent a lot of years, you and I talking about, man, this grift and these guys will say anything to get a paycheck. I think it's also important to add, these are just really bad human beings. Yeah. I mean, when, you know, the past few days has really emphasized, these are just lousy human beings because there comes a moment where there are things you just don't say, no matter how much of a paycheck there might be in it. And, um, you know, it's clear that there is no bottom for these folks. Now, does that lead to a crack up? within the Republican Party? I don't think so, because I think the entertainment wing is going to say, yeah, yeah, they got to say what they've got to say, and that's fine. We're not really talking to them. We're talking to the public. But the feedback loop is that the more of this poison the public takes in, the more they expect this from their elected representatives. So eventually, you know, the rot will seep in. But for now, I think there's a little more distance between the electeds and the entertainers and I think they're happy to leave each other alone for the time being. But I don't know how long it's going to last. I, I, I think your analysis is exactly right. And I think that's the way it's going to play out. But back to your point about what horrible human beings they, they are. And I know this may seem redundant, but our new colleague, Will Salatin, has a great piece about Tucker Carlson and, and his uh, pro-Russian propaganda. And he really points out the kinds of things that, that Carlson is is doing. For example, on Tuesday, he impugned the patriotism of Alexander Vindman, you know, who's a Ukrainian American who, you know, came okay. to he went farther than that. I mean, he yeah. smeared him with a, with one of I those know. dual loyalty. Absolutely. That's what I was know. getting. I mean, look, this is a guy who, you know, joined the military, he's earned a purple heart in, in Iraq. And then he, he says, well, Carlson says, well, Vindman, you have a moral obligation to defend his homeland. I, uh, there's just a virulent anti-Americanism to Tucker Carlson that is, it's extraordinary. And I know you and I, we both struggle with this. It's like, how does yeah. everybody not see this? How, how well, do you also, go through this and, and go, yeah, I'm still listening to this guy. This guy is still reliable. <laughs> I still trust him. Totally agree with you. This is something we both struggled with for a long time, including the question of how much money is enough? I mean, does it, Yeah, you're already, you know, making money hand over fist. You have more money than you will ever spend. You have fame. You have millions of eyeballs tuning into you every night. And yet it's not enough. You still have to smear a wounded veteran of the United States Armed Forces because it was just hanging there. People have said this about Putin, right? Gary Kasparov always says, Putin never says why. He says, why not? And I think, you know, when you're listening to Carlson and these kinds of horrendous smears on people and these kind of nutball anti-American things that come out of him. It's almost like he's always saying, I could avoid saying this, but why not? Why not just say it? Because let's see what happens. Let's let's throw another turd in the punch bowl. Let's throw another grenade in the pool and see what happens. And it really is horrifying. But I think two things. First, the entire entertainment wing of the Republican Party has basically been gripped by oppositional defiance disorder. Sure. Yes. That they're just against everything. There's no there's no there there. Oh, Tulsi Gabbard? Yeah, she's against a lot of stuff. Let's get her. 
you know, and she's got a fan base of weirdos who follow her because she's an attractive woman and the people that were plumping for her and the Democrats, sure, bring them to CPAC. Why not? But the other thing I think is that there is a, with folks like Carlson and the others, and I, I, I tried to kind of get at this in a tweet the other day where I said, they're so angry at a system and an establishment that doesn't value them as much as they think they should be valued, that they are literally willing to support the Kremlin going to war in Europe as a way of kind of getting back. You know, I, I said the other day, imagine how history could have been different and how many people's brains could have been spared all this toxic waste if MSNBC and CNN hadn't fired Carlson. <laughs> like, you know, the guy gets shit canned and says, OK, fine, I'm on Russia's side. OK, what if Donald Trump had gotten more affection from his father? I mean, yeah. how, how, <laughs> how history would have been how history would have been different. No, I think on this on this whole you know range of what what's going to happen among the Republican Party, um, I, I think, again, let's kind of underline the fact that there should be no illusions that the entertainment wing is the dominant wing of the Republican Party, not the elected officials. Tucker Carlson is much more influential in MAGA world than Mitch McConnell. So eventually they will go that way, but also because there's gradations. You know, on one end, there's pro-Putin, and then sort of adjacent to that is anti-anti-Putin. Well, we're not defending Putin, but we're just ripping all of his critics. We've seen this before. And then, of course, you have the one unifying theme, which is that whatever happens, we're anti-Biden. So if Biden's too strong, he's a warmonger or he's a weenie, we're going to rip him for either way. Because essentially, the id of the Republican Party is let's go, Brandon. That's it. I mean, there's no coherent foreign policy. Yeah, there's there's no coherent foreign policy. And they'll all settle down to the let's go, Brandon, foreign policy, which is that you may not be pro-Putin, you may not even be anti-anti-Putin, but you're definitely going to be anti-anything Biden does. Yeah, I mean, it, it is it is this, the GOP, um, which went from this confident can-do you know, really almost overconfident party when you and I were, you know, uh, I, I came in a little after you did in the late 70s, but, you know, it's certainly in the 1980s, this party of sort of very robust kind of, you know, we can solve all the world's problems, we can win the Cold War, we can fix the economy, um, you know, again, even to the point maybe of overconfidence well, has no now kidding. become this insecure, grievance-ridden party of angry losers. And I don't mean actual losers, but self-identifying people who somehow deep down feel they've been done dirt and that they are, they think of themselves as losers. And it's, and every political utterance is just this constant lashing out about everything. Right. I think something else has happened as well, that the entire focus of the right has shifted from foreign opponents, you know, with the end of the Cold War, no longer focused on enemies like the Kremlin. The real enemies are domestic. They have turned their eyes homeward so that the people that are really the threat to America are their fellow Americans. So it, it's it, it's interesting. I mean, every once in a while, you'll have somebody will talk about being tough with China, et cetera, et cetera. But the real animus, the real passion, the real emotions are reserved for fellow Americans. And, and that's, you know, that, that's interesting because clearly there's a complete indifference on the part of many of these Republicans to uh, what Vladimir Putin is doing. By the way, do you see Susan Glasser had a great tweet talking about um, all of the suddenly born again hawks in the Republican Party who are issuing statements, which, again, I agree with. But she says, Lord, the gaslighting by Republicans this morning with hawkish BS after literally enabling a pro-Putin president for four years and refusing to stop him, even when he literally blackmailed Ukraine with millions in security aid to help Ukraine fight Russia. You know, that's kind of a bracing. Can you just remember people? Okay, you, you know, those of you that are standing up and saying, this is terrible, you know, we need to stop Vladimir Putin. Where were you for the last four years? How do you cognitively align that with 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 your your shilling for Trump and the fact that you may support putting him back in the Oval Office? Yeah. And uh, some of the other folks out there saying, well, you know, at least under Trump, we had a tough Russia policy. No, we didn't. We had a legacy policy of being relatively tough on Russia that was carried over from the end of the Obama era. And, you know, frankly, Obama wasn't paying enough attention to Russia. But after Crimea and 
there were sanctions in place. And, and what's really astonishing is the same people that are glorifying those four years under Trump. I almost feel like it's gaslighting to just have to talk about it, but Trump was actively trying to undermine the rest of the government because he didn't want to openly change the policy. So he said things like, you know, yeah, sure, that's our policy, you know, and the State Department, and then quietly saying, okay, but that's not our policy. Blackmail Ukraine, yes. tell them they don't get any of this. And so the people that got trapped in that, the, the people like Vinman and Fiona Hill and others were saying, look, I'm executing the official policy in the United States, but now I'm in trouble because the president keeps whispering under his breath um, that that's not really the policy because he didn't because he knew what he was doing was illegal. Yes, we're going to give military aid to Ukraine. Now hold the military aid until they give me an investigation of Joe Biden. Um, you know, this is and and these same as you just pointed out, I guess we're you know we're in heated loud agreement here. These same Republicans were saying are, are now saying, well, of course we've got to be tough on uh, on Putin. Well, you know, again, what you had a president actively blackmailing he was the country that's for it <laughs> he was impeached for blackmailing the country that's now under a russian invasion and yet somehow this is joe biden's fault and if only donald trump the greatest enemy outside of russia that nato ever had by the way uh um you know that somehow things would be right with the world I and mean, it's just it's just an astonishing level of cognitive dissonance and unbelievable bullshittery yes but one thing that trump has learned is there is no such thing as history you just revise it you lose an election you just you know make up the big lie that you won the election uh, you blackmail Ukraine, you suck up to Vladimir Putin, you appease Vladimir Putin, you revise that history into he was afraid of you. He was terrified. He would never have done this. I mean, yeah, look, uh, Vladimir Putin was not going to invade Ukraine when Donald Trump was in the White House because the the greatest strategic success um, of his life was was having a an appeaser actually as president of the United States. He just wasn't going to fuck that up. Right. Do you yeah. agree? I mean, uh, yeah, that this. Oh, well, why didn't he do it? Well, Trump was president. Why would you kill yeah. the goose laying golden eggs? Well, yes, exactly. Um, you know what? You're getting everything you want from him. He's weakening NATO. And I, I firmly believe that in the second term, when basically Tr Putin had wrung everything he could get out of Trump, we'd be right where we are now and maybe even sooner and in a worse condition. But but the other thing, it, when people talk about this. I'm sorry. Did everybody forget that Helsinki happened? Yeah. Does Does everybody remember? You know, Donald Trump standing there like a whipped puppy. Uh, one of the recent books about Trump also says that Trump has basically been telling people that in a second term he would probably pull out of NATO or gut NATO. Yeah. And Susan Glasser says she can confirm this story. In fact. Trump had privately indicated that he would seek to withdraw from NATO and to blow up the U.S. alliance with South Korea should he win re-election. Yeah, the second term, Trump had said, we'll do it in the second term. And this is from I Alone Can Fix It, a book excerpt, you know, the, the book right. excerpt from Carol Lennig and Philip Rucker. So this is this is solidly reported. I mean, this seems to be relevant for all of the the Republicans who suddenly decided that they are going to be hawkish and that they're going to you know stand up and be strong. They have supported somebody who um, is has undermined NATO and might actually destroy it if he gets back into the presidency. So I don't know. Well, you know, Obama gets roasted for a hot mic moment where he says something that is relatively innocuous, but that probably you shouldn't say out loud to a Russian prime minister, you mm -hmm. know, on arms control, on the yeah. START treaty. Okay. I'll have a little more flexibility after the election. Yeah. OK, you know, uh, th we have we have incidences of that, you know, Ford and Brezhnev at Vladivostok had conversations like that. It, it's bad. But, you know, the right wing completely lost its mind about that. Here's Trump telling, just saying point blank. And of course, don't think for a moment that Putin didn't know this. Uh, yeah, if I get into a second term, I'll obliterate NATO and all of our most important security alliances. Again, it's incredible. And as you say, now to have Republicans standing up and saying, no, no, you know, I'm here to defend the future of freedom in Europe. Uh, I mean, it is galling. It's really incredible. It, it is. Well, we're going to continue this conversation. Just a reminder, the Thursday night Bulwark live stream. Uh, tonight at eight o'clock Eastern time for Bulwark Plus members, Amanda Carpenter, Bill Crystal, me and 
Tom Nichols back. So for, for all of you that think, well, Charlie, why didn't you ask Tom about this? Well, we didn't get to a lot of things. Uh, I want to talk about um, your piece that you wrote for The Atlantic. Putin chooses a forever war. Tune in tonight, Thursday night, Bulwark. It's our exclusive weekly live stream for Bulwark Plus members. If you join today, you'll be able to uh, to access it. And again, if you do, you can leave comments. You can leave questions for tonight. That is tonight at 8 o'clock. Tom Nichols, once again, I cannot express how grateful I am that you've uh, carved out some time on this very busy day to talk with us. Thanks, Charlie. Good to be with you. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow, and we'll do this all over again. See you tonight.